be here last month to accommodate your speaking schedule reshuffle, but I was sick with a severe cold for about 10 days prior to the Sabbath of February 24th. I was really disappointed that I couldn't be here last month, and I'm still kind of recovering from a cold this month and also severe oak pollen allergies. So I'm going to probably, throughout this message, be partaking of some water. I do have a lozenge in my mouth as well. So I pray that I can get through the message here just fine today. And, you know, the interesting thing is, by the time I was done preparing this message, which I had obviously more time to work on, God had taken me in an almost completely different direction than where I had planned to go. So, so much for plans, I guess. But when I was done, I realized that this is possibly the most important message that I have shared at any time, anywhere, ever. So, brethren, I pray that this message will be a great blessing to you. I'm going to begin today by quoting from a portion of a well-known scripture, but in the original Greek. Metanoio, kahi, hey, euangelion. Does anybody here recognize those words which Jesus spoke? No? Okay, we'll come back to them towards the end of this message, and then you will very much know why I quoted them just now. Theme-wise, today's message is a continuation of my previous message and is titled, Preparing to Serve God and God's People, Part 2. In January, we did a bit of a deep dive into the subject of the ironic blessing of Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26, if you remember. And eventually, brother and I intend to begin speaking quite extensively about the charisma, or spiritual gifts, which God so graciously gives to his called-out ones so that they can better serve and build up the spiritual body of Christ Jesus. But there's some foundational work which I need to share with you first, before I begin speaking about the spiritual gifts. And this foundational work involves me today discussing with you about our calling and what God the Father and Christ Jesus expect from us when the Father extends to us a supernatural calling or drawing of us to him. Because how we respond to that calling determines if we're really preparing and allowing ourselves to be prepared to serve God and God's people. As we get started today, I want to look at some notable events in history which have affected all who profess Jesus as Savior, both those who have held on to the Sabbath like us, as well as Sunday observers. So, event number one, 382 A.D., Jerome begins work on what would become known as the Latin Vulgate Bible. The work was completed in 405 A.D., but he continued to edit his work for years. Wikipedia states, quote, For over a thousand years, A.D. 400 to 1530, the Vulgate was the most commonly used edition of the most influential text in Western European society. Indeed, for most Western Christians, especially Catholics, it was the only version of the Bible ever encountered, only truly being eclipsed in the mid-20th century. I wasn't aware of that. Event number two, King Henry VIII of England completes his break from the Roman Catholic Church in 1534. And event number three, in 1604, King James I of England commissions Richard Bancroft, the Archbishop of Canterbury of the Anglican Church, to oversee the translation of a new English translation of the Holy Bible. The authorized version, or King James Version, is then published in 1611. Later in this message, we'll see how these events have affected each of us in unexpected ways. But brethren, the Apostle Paul was always encouraging the brethren to help and serve each other, right? Paul desired that God's people spend the necessary time in preparation to serve God and God's people. It seems, though, that people often have to be reminded what are their duties and responsibilities. It is in a passage of Scripture in Hebrews we'll look at today, where Paul identifies what brethren 
should have been doing, but we're not doing. As we examine it, we'll also discover a portion of a verse which is often misunderstood. And while we uncover what that verse really means, we'll look into the Apostle Paul's own dramatic calling by God and see what deep lessons we can apply to ourselves to make our own calling and election sure. So brethren, let's continue with this little journey today. Please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 12 through 14. We're going to read this in the New King James translation. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hmm. So we don't know exactly when this epistle was written or by whom. Many believe that the Apostle Paul was the author, and I'm in that camp. We also don't know who was the original audience, although they were Jews. But it's the application we can see can be for all believers. Apparently, these believers had been baptized for some time, <clears throat> which meant that they had the benefit of having the Holy Spirit to reside in them. The author, let's say Paul, suggests that by now they should be teachers, which is translated from the Greek word didaskalos, meaning instructors. We'll see in the future, brethren, that a didaskalos, a teacher, is a charisma, a gift of the Spirit given by God in his grace to his people so that they can better serve each other. But Paul here in Hebrews says in verse 11 that these Hebrews need to be taught spiritual milk and not solid food. So clearly Paul is not happy about this. He wrote something similar to the congregation in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3, I'll read it in the literal standard version. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? This scripture explains why some are not maturing spiritually and still need to be taught milky subjects. They're still acting carnally by responding to the pulls of the flesh. This scripture can be applied to God's people today, of course. And thinking back to Hebrews 5, 9 through 14, are we here all capable of being teachers? According to Paul, that's the goal, right? Brethren, I think there are a number of very good pre-Passover questions in verse 14 to ask ourselves if we have the courage. Let's proceed on to the next chapter, Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3. And we'll also continue in the New King James. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Brethren, as a didaskalos, a teacher. If you were asked to explain Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, how would you do it? I ask because according to Paul, in the context of chapter 5, it should probably be a fairly milky subject. 
these various elements are described as elementary principles of Christ. And Paul suggests that we need to understand these before we can go on to perfection. He also states that we should be forward-looking, so to speak, and be moving on past these things so that we can go on to perfection. Have you ever recognized this? Is everyone here today confident that they can fully understand and can explain each of these elementary principles of Christ? Well, brethren, I think there is one which is often misunderstood by many in the body of Christ. And I believe it would behoove us today to come to a better understanding. Because in the context of today's subject of preparing to serve, it could be a bit difficult if we discover that we have a misunderstanding with one of these elementary principles of Christ. I don't believe that we have a problem with accurately, accurately describing baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, or eternal judgment. But repentance from dead works and of faith toward God is actually misunderstood. And the reason that it's misunderstood is quite surprising. So brethren, the first elementary principle is Christ is misunderstood because of the three historical events which I described to you earlier. Jerome's Latin Vulgate Bible translation, King Henry VIII breaking from the Roman Catholic Church, and the King James Bible translation being commissioned. This resulted in a new word definition being substituted for the original Greek word in Hebrews 6.1, first by Jerome, and then that word itself was substituted by a similar upgraded related word by Richard Bancroft's King James translator some 1,200 years later. And we still use that word today in our Bibles. So let me ask this question. If we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free, John 8, 32. And if first a Roman Catholic translator, Jerome, and then later Anglican church translators gave us words which are not truth, it is, is it important that we, God's called out ones, are led to discover the truth of the matter? Well, yes, it is. But dealing with institutional orthodoxy is usually difficult. I've known about this since 2007, but it's difficult to talk about. People who were educated in a certain way years ago and have learned and taught a certain way in a certain system often have a narrow way of looking at matters. But here we are today, brethren. Surprisingly, the substituted word in Hebrews 6.1, which we still use is the word repentance in the phrase we just read, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In a few minutes, we will identify the original Greek word which suffered the substitution by Jerome, who chose to translate it into the Latin word penance. Then we'll be able to compare the original Greek word with both penance and repentance and their respective definitions. But brethren, as we hopefully achieve those important goals, we also need to understand this first elementary principle of Christ for at least two reasons. Number one, so that we can see how God desires to prepare our minds to receive his truths, whatever they are. And number two, so we can better understand how God expects us to re respond to his calling. And as I proceed today, I want to contrast the Apostle Paul's own calling with our traditional understanding of repentance and then apply that to the correct understanding of the first elementary principle of Christ. And hopefully the examples that I'm going to share with you today will open up new thoughts in our minds, which will show us a greater depth available to us from our calling, which God has extended to us, than maybe we've ever imagined before. I trust that you will find this very enlightening. The Apostle Paul, while he was still Saul, was called by God the Father quite dramatically, right? We can read that account in Acts chapter 9. So let's turn there and read Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6 together. And again, we'll do this in New King James. Acts 9, 3 through 6. <clears throat> 
And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you shall be told what you must do. Let's skip ahead now and read verses 10 through 20. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Well, that's pretty strange, isn't it? There's no mention of Saul being compelled to feel that he was a transgressor of God's law, to confess his sins to ask forgiveness, or to do anything that resembles what is normally taught as repentance or repenting of sin. He fasted for three days and was praying. We do not know what he said in his prayers. When the disciple and apparent elder Ananias arrived, Saul had hands laid on him, he was baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Then he went out and proclaimed Christ. Here's another description of the event, which is part of Paul's defense at Jerusalem. Let's just read Acts 22, verses 12 through 16. Acts 22, verses 12 through 16. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voice and said, whoop, uh, wrong verse. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Brethren, please notice that Ananias did not counsel Saul for baptism or ask him if he had repented of his sins, as is usually done in our era. Actually, the opposite occurred. Ananias asked Paul why he was waiting. Saul did not delay, of course, and he never looked back on his previous life. This is highly instructive. So what did Saul experience when called by Almighty God? This will be made clear later in this message. 
How did Paul later describe himself in Scripture? Please turn with him next to Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. We're going to read this in the modern King James translation. Philippians 3, 5 through 11. Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as regards the law. I was a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness of the law, blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. But no, rather, I count all things to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them to be dung so that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. So, not an evil sinner according to the law, but blameless. That does not mean that he never committed a sin, of course. However, this whole dissertation here by Paul describes someone whose life had been wholly involved in dead works, regardless of his righteousness which came from the law. Nothing in the Jewish religion led to eternal life. The blood of bulls and goats don't take away sins. Paul's own zeal for the law also resulted in the deaths of believers, which was not illegal according to the law of Moses. Paul recognized that. But Paul was willing to give up his position and honor as a Pharisee for an amazing reason. Paul wrote in verses 10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Brethren, how many of us here have thought that about ourselves? Being made conformable to his death? As we all should know, in Matthew chapter 23, Christ Jesus pronounces eight woes upon the religious establishment of his time. Jesus either says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, or he says, woe to you, blind guides. <clears throat> the entirety of chapter 23 is an indictment of a religious system that looked good on the outside, but inside was full of corruption. This was a religious system which Jesus confronted during most of his three-and-a-half-year ministry. This religious system of Judaism had begun an oppressive burden on the people, and Jesus describes the system as being full of dead men's bones, all uncleanness, hypocrisy, and lawlessness. When Jesus the Christ arrived on the scene, the people were already enslaved by a burdensome religious system which had distorted the people's understanding of the true nature of God. It was a system which Jesus specifically spoke against, not the entirety of the Torah, God's commandments, statutes, and judgments. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus tells the scribes and Pharisees that they have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. In Matthew 15, 7 through 9, Jesus pointedly informs the scribes and Pharisees, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. Their actions were not reflecting God's love, justice, mercy, forgiveness, and grace. The religion of the Jewish people was one of dead works. The Pharisee Saul was very much a part of this corrupted religious system. The problem was Saul did not realize that it was corrupt until he was struck down by God. 
Saul was a God-fearing person who kept the Old Testament law and thought he was serving God while he was persecuting the supposedly blaspheming Christians. Saul, though, surrendered himself to Messiah Jesus over an approximately three-day period of time. But here's a lesson for us. Saul's example, when properly understood, can actually apply to everyone whom God the Father has ever extended a calling. But men, unfortunately, have made understanding the process more difficult. Saul very quickly recognized that his past life was one of dead works. That is what Hebrews 6.1 is describing. Only through faith in God the Father and in Christ could he have any hope for life. Saul prayed and fasted for three days after being blinded while he was waiting to be told what to do. We have no indication in any scripture that he was compelled to feel that he was a transgressor of God's law, to dredge up and confess his past sins, or to do anything that resembles what is normally taught as repenting. God is no respecter of persons. So what does Paul's experience instruct us? In Hebrews 6.1, we read in English, breaking into the thought, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. In the Greek, it would read, Mi katabalo palin themelios metanoia apo necros ergon kai pistis epi theos. Metanoia there is translated as repentance. But that is very interesting because etymologically, repentance is not at all related to metanoia. So why then does the word repentance appear in our Bibles? Because, my friends, a series of Bible translations put it there, beginning with Jerome's Latin Vulgate Bible, who initially translated metanoia as penitentium, later translated into the English word penance, in the official Catholic Dewey Reims 1582 Bible translation. Most people are not aware of that. We now need to look at some word translations, but it won't be boring, okay? And please don't try to write all the details down. I will eventually organize the information in an easy to read outline form as I have done before with other subjects, so we can all just relax a bit. Of course, we all understand that the English, in the English language, the word repentance is derived from the English word repent, right? Good. Repentance is referenced in Strong's, as Strong's number 3341, and the underlying Greek word is metanoia. The definition of repentance in Thayer's Greek definitions is a change of mind as it appears to one who repents, of a purpose he has formed or something he has done. This is a bit confusing because Thayer's uses the word repents in their own definition of repentance. Also, the definition limits the definition to two areas only, purposes formed and actions done. What we actually need to understand is what is the definition of the Greek word metanoia? The word metanoia is what the people in the first century would have heard or read, not repentance. So I hope that the following explanation will make everything easier for us to understand. And it's really this next information which begins to clear everything up. So please stay with me. In the New Testament of our Bibles, the Greek word which is translated as repent is the word metanoio, which is Strong's number 3340. This word is composed of the prefix meta and the verb noio. Noeo is derived from the noun nu, N-O-U-S, which means the mind. The verb noeo means to understand, to perceive with the mind. So in Thayer's Greek definitions, we find these definitions are the root words of metanoio. Meta means with, after, behind, and noeo means to perceive with the mind, to understand, to have understanding, to think upon, to heed, to ponder, to consider. So we have to put those things together. 
The verb metanoi is used 34 times in the New Testament and is always translated as repent in the King James Version of the Bible. And remember, we've had the King James translation since 1611. So from the root word definitions, we can determine that metanoia means, one, to have a change of mind, two, to think differently with the mind, three, to perceive from a different point of view than before, and four, to ponder and consider deeply so to have a different understanding and perception. So when people would hear that Greek word back then, when Jesus spoke or the apostles spoke, that's what they understood. They didn't hear repent. They heard those definitions. But brethren, those are not the usual definitions of what people think of when they hear the word repent, are they? No, they're not. And notice that these accurate definitions are not limited just to purposes formed or actions done as are Thayer's definition of repentance. The change of mind could be about any subject whatsoever. And therein lies some of the problem with the words repent and repentance we find in our Bibles. This misunderstanding of metanoia is what creates a misunderstanding in Hebrews 6.1. Metanoia is exclusively about a person's experiencing a change of mind. And I know that what I've just said conflicts with what is normally taught about repenting and repentance. But facts are facts. We in concordances and lexicons and study helps have inherited bad definitions first implemented beginning some 300 years after the deaths of the apostles. But brethren, we have the Holy Spirit. With God's help, we can understand. We can contrast the clear understanding of metanoia, which hopefully we now have, with the recognized definitions of repent and repentance, which we find in popular dictionaries. So, continuing... The American Heritage Dictionary gives this definition, repent, to feel regret for what one has done or failed to do. Also, to feel contrition for one's sins and to abjure or renounce sinful ways. The Webster Encyclopedia Dictionary of the English Language gives this definition. One, repent. To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or left undone by oneself. Two, to experience sorrow for sin as produces amendment of life. Three, to be penitent. Four, to remember with compunction or self-reproach. Five, to feel self-accusing pain or grief on account of. Those are certainly definitions which everyone here is familiar with, right? Okay. So every time we read or say repent, those are the definitions we insert into the conversation or into the scripture. This is dramatically different from metanoia or to have a change of mind, to think differently with the mind or perceive from a different point of view than before or to ponder and consider deeply or to have a different understanding of perception. Merriam-Webster gives this definition, repentance. The actions or process of repenting, especially for misdeeds and moral shortcomings. But yet, the actual definition of metanoia would be a change of mind as it appears to one who has had a change of mind. That's pretty simple, actually. Misdeeds and moral shortcomings don't have to figure into the change of mind. And yet, brethren, it is said that repentance is a change of mind and behavior. Well, brethren, the word repentance does describe that because the word repentance is first a Roman Catholic and then an Anglican church invention, and it is not the same as metanoia. Another point. This whole substitution of words and definitions thing by the Roman Catholics and the Anglicans should make us all very alarmed because it has done so much damage to so many people for so long. The online etymology dictionary gives this definition. Repent. 13th century. To feel such regret for sins or crimes as produces amendment of life. 
from Old French repentir, 11th century, from re, that's R-E, here probably an intensive prefix, plus vulgar Latin penitire to regret, from Latin penitire to make sorry, from pina, see penal. Then they say this, the distinction between regret and repent is made in many modern languages, but the differentiation is not present in older periods. Well, that's interesting. The next word, penal. We're familiar with that. Of or pertaining to punishment by law, mid-15th century, from Old French penal, 12th century, directly from medieval Latin penalis, pertaining to punishment from pena, punishment. Brethren, the words repent, repentance, and penance have much to do with the ideas of regret and punishment, but nothing to do with the original words spoken by Jesus and spoken and written by the apostles, which were metanoio and metanoia. But millions of people had been misled by these substituted words for centuries. Let me now share with you two quotes which I discovered online just before I finished preparing this message. I was surprised but very encouraged that this understanding was out there, so to speak. Scholar J. Glentworth Butler says that <clears throat> in the Greek, there is none of the sorrow or regret contained in the words repentance and repent. Repentance denotes, quote, sorrow for what one has done or omitted to do, especially for contrition of sin, unquote. Repent primarily means, quote, to review one's actions and feel contrition or regret for something one has done or omitted to do, unquote. Therefore, Butler asserts that translating metanoio and metanoia as repent and repentance constitute, quote, an utter mistranslation, unquote, that translators excuse by the fact that no English word can adequately convey the meaning of the Greek words. Archibald Thomas Robertson concurs with Butler. Regarding the translation of metanoia as repentance, Robertson calls it, quote, a linguistic and theological tragedy, unquote. Regarding John the Baptist's call to, quote, repent as a translation of the Greek metanoiite, Robertson quotes John Albert Broadus as saying that this is, quote, the worst translation in the New Testament, unquote. Repent means, quote, to be sorry, unquote, but John's call was not to be sorry, but to change mental attitudes, metanoiaite, and conduct. Robertson lamented the fact that in his time, there was no English word that signified the meaning of the Greek metanoia. Quite eye-opening, right? I'm going to make two comments. Number one, you don't really need an equivalent English word if you just use several words to convey the meaning like I've been doing all along in this message. And number two, Robertson was very close. Metanoia is a change of mind, which includes thinking, attitudes, and motivations. But change of conduct and behaviors are represented by a different Greek word and describe a different transformative process. We don't have time to go into that today, but we need to. Brethren, Saul's response to his calling, I have an itchy nose. Maybe you've noticed. I'm sorry. Saul's response to his calling in Acts chapter 9 perfectly illustrates the experience of metanoia. Saul recognized the overwhelming evidence that Jesus was the Son of God and the prophesied Messiah. He simply, over three days, changed his mind as an entire thinking about his identity and his purpose of life. No longer was he the Pharisee of Pharisees, zealous for the law, but in the wrong way, obtaining his righteousness from the law, but now Saul's identity was in Christ Jesus. He counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, 
His righteousness was from God by faith, not from the law. He wanted to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. And Saul saw himself being conformed to Jesus' death. Later, Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. Are we imitators of Paul? Is our identity in Christ? Have we given up our entire past life for Christ? Do we want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings? Are we crucified with Christ? Have we really changed our mind and our thinking? Metanoia? Paul's response to his calling doesn't really describe what is usually described by the common definitions of repent or repentance. The great misunderstanding, so to speak, began with Jerome's Latin Vulgate Bible, which he translated in the 4th century. For another example, in Acts 2.38, Jerome's Latin Vulgate Bible in the official Catholic Douay Reims Bible 1582 translation reads, But Peter said to them, Do penance and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jerome had translated metanoio as do penance. In the King James it reads, Repent. We read that passage every year at Pentecost. But seriously, brethren, do penance? Why do penance instead of metanoio? Metanoio, of course, means to have a change of mind, to think differently in the mind. Here are three common definitions of penance so that we understand. One, an ecclesiastical punishment imposed for sin. Two, the suffering to which a person subjects himself as an expression of repentance. Three, a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church for the remission of sin. Again, why did Jerome choose do penance? Remember, he used the same word in Hebrews 6.1. Are we beginning to see the problem? Did Peter in Acts 2.38 actually tell 3,000 people, receive an ecclesiastical punishment imposed for sin or subject yourself to suffering as an expression of repentance and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ? (laughs) Of course not. The Catholic Church has always been focused on various punishments and also indulgences, of course. However, metanoio, meaning change your mind or change your thinking or have a different understanding or perception, does not involve punishment and does not have to involve sin. To further compound the problem, the Anglican Church King James translators in 1611 translated the Greek word metanoio into the word repent and the Greek word metanoia into the word repentance, which were upgrades from Jerome's previous translation choice of penance. These unfortunate errors remain with us today. But again, these words chosen by the translators are not etymologically related to either metanoia or metanoia of the original Greek. And by saying not etymologically, I mean that the words are not historically related. But let's be clear. If sin is involved in a believer's life, then sorrow can be present when a person experiences change in their mind. Paul shows that in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. But most metanoia, which we experience, which involves in us experiencing metanoia, does not involve sin. 
It simply involves us having changed thinking, changed understanding, changed perceptions, and changed motivations. What Peter actually said in Acts 2.38 was this. But Peter said to them, Metanoio, change your thinking and your mind, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then Peter said these wonderful words in verses 39 to 41. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all those afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he earnestly testified and exhorted, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added about 3,000 souls. My friend, on this day of Pentecost, there was simply no talk of acknowledging sins, repenting of sins, confessing sins, asking forgiveness of sins, or anything remotely resembling the definitions of repent and repentance, which are in the dictionaries which I've shared with you, and which are commonly used in sermons and publications year after year. Instead, there is an invitation and exhortation to accept a divine calling to receive forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, and salvation. And the 3,000 people were willing to accept the invitation now that they were fully convinced by Peter's words that the prophesied Messiah had come, had been in their midst for several years, and he was now their risen Savior and Lord. Peter's words, coupled with the presence of the Holy Spirit that day, created the experience of metanoia in each of the listeners. But let me clarify an important point before I'm taken out back and drawn and quartered. I'm not saying in any place in this message that there is not a place for acknowledgement of sin and confession of sin and the asking of God's forgiveness from time to time. There is. It's just that it was not the time or place in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, nor is it in Hebrews 6 verse 1. And neither is it in many other scriptures as well, where Roman Catholic or Anglican inserted definitions of penance, repent, or repentance are used, rather than the proper definitions of metanoia or metanoia. God's people need to understand this. For hundreds of years, people have been following scriptures containing man's definitions of penance, repent, and repentance, rather than Almighty God's directives of metanoia and metanoia. The hijacking of the original Greek words metanoio and metanoia and their true definitions and their substitutions by first the Roman Catholics with the word penance and later the Anglicans with the words repent and repentance is as damaging and insidious as the replacement of the Sabbath with Sunday and Passover with Easter. When we allow men to insert words, penance, repent, and repentance into our Bibles with their meanings, which are not at all historically connected to the original Greek words metanoio and metanoia, we severely limit our understanding of what Almighty God is trying to communicate to us through his holy scriptures. The Pharisee Saul's calling and his response to it to become the Apostle Paul is the perfect example to illustrate Hebrews 6.1 of not laying again the foundation of having a change of thinking and of mind in regards to dead works and of faith toward God. That's how that portion of Hebrews 6.1 should read. Paul would never go back to his dead works, many of which were not sin. <clears throat> and neither should we go back to our dead works. But brethren, when teachers insert the subject of sin too strongly into their explanations of this scripture, it obscures the actual elementary principle of Christ, which Paul was inspired to record for us. This subject is so important that I believe that we all need to examine ourselves to a greater degree, especially before the coming Passover, and determine what dead works we still may be holding on to, which may be getting in the way of our spiritual maturity and our spiritual discernment. 
The principle is that our purpose for living in newness of life with a changed mind and changed thinking is supposed to be for God the Father and God the Son, just like the Apostle Paul. It's not just to stop sinning or keep the Sabbath or keep the holy days. Exhibiting faith toward God requires the believer to be about our Father's business always. It requires a real change of mind. It requires a real turning from the ways of the world to the ways of God. It requires developing increasing love for the brethren. It requires a growing desire to serve the brethren and build up the spiritual temple which God is building. It requires many other things as well. Early on in this message, I said that we need to understand the first elementary principle of Christ in Hebrews 6 1 for at least two reasons. Number one, so that we can see how God desires to prepare our minds to receive his truths, whatever they are. And number two, so that we can better understand how God expects us to respond to our calling. And I trust that you can better understand now as I prepare to conclude this message why I made those statements. A person's calling under the new covenant shows that God is much more focused on the working of the person's mind than ever before in human history. There is more to discuss about what I've been sharing with you today, but I'm running out of time. And believe it or not, the words penance and repent have been substituted for other words as well in both the Old and New Testaments for Bibles. And that has caused other confusion. But as I begin to close today, <clears throat> let's consider the scripture, part of which I mentioned towards the beginning of this message. Metanoio kahi he euangelion. Jesus said those words at the beginning of his ministry where he sets the stage as to how he is going to reach out to a very needy humanity. So let's turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 14 and 15. Mark 1, 14 and 15 in the New King James. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, Repent and believe in the gospel. When people attempt to explain this passage, they will say, Look, Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. Then they will say, repent of what? Their answer is, why, repent of sin, of course. Then they will continue with their explanations, having inserted the subject of sin into Jesus' exhortation and proclamation. Their explanations are incorrect, and they cloud Jesus' words, compounded by using definitions of the substituted word repent in their explanations as we have seen. The train kind of goes off the rails fast, so to speak. In reality, all Jesus actually said to his audience was, Metanoio. Change your thinking and your mind and believe the good news. What Jesus meant was that unless the audience was willing to accept his words and explanations and believe them, they could not believe the good news of the kingdom of God. They would remain locked in the dead works of Judaism and their worldview would not change. Jesus was making no reference to sin. Jesus was not telling the Jewish population that they were not very good at keeping the commandments of the laws of Moses. Jesus was not referring to sin at all. He was simply exhorting the listeners to be willing to accept a different point of view than they'd ever heard before. He had much to tell them. We much cons must consider that every time that Jesus spoke, that his words were so different from anyone else that any hearer might experience a form of metanoia. Jesus' words contrasted greatly with the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. His words were life and they were truth. And so might we, brethren, 
Every time we hear or read or discover some information which we recognize as truth, which we might not have known before, we can experience a change of thinking and change of mind. In fact, that's what the Word of God, under the prompting of the Holy Spirit, is supposed to create with each of us. Every Bible study, every sermon, and in many conversations. My own self-examination before Passover and the Feast of Eleven Bread this year is focused on what I've discussed with you today. How do I compare with how Paul responded to his calling? How has my mind changed over the past number of years? How much effort do I put forth in preparation and understanding scripture to serve God's people? What are my motivations for serving God and God's people? Am I crucified with Christ? Am I experiencing increased metanoia? Am I more content and thankful? There are many more questions. My friends, let us begin in earnest today as we seek to understand to a better degree how God offers us the ability to experience metanoia every day and truly take on the mind of Christ and the merciful, humble, serving nature of the ever-living ones. May Almighty God bless you greatly, my brethren. I look forward to seeing you the next time when we meet again to worship our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Redeemer Jesus. Shabbat Shalom.